Okay, God bless you. Please prove God. Thank you for sharing self and time uh, with uh, us and this purpose and kingdom business. We know that we live and move and have our being through God. We're here because of the grace we have through God and from God. And we are able, even right now, to call his name and focus on him as God because he's present. And his presence it causes us to uh, actually come into life and life. So praise be the name. Uh, it is that name. And that's what we will hold sovereignly, uh, hold to his sovereignty. So praise God. Um, first, I would like to... Um, Get you, uh, give us some primary text and then we'll take off from there. So we're going to go to Book of Numbers, uh, chapter 22. Um, we are working on the same theme, blessing and cursing. This will be the third iteration of it. Uh, preferably, it is making some things clearer for you and hopefully bringing some clarity for your uh, others that you will be able to minister to as well in principles and the power of God and text in the text that's given us in the Holy Scriptures. All right, so we're going to start in Numbers chapter 22, verse 1. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan, by Jericho. And Balak, or Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done unto the Amorites, and Moab was sore afraid of the people, because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all, or all that are around us, as the ox licketh up all the grass of the field, and Balak the son of Zippor was king of Mo of the Moabites at that time. Verse five. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, Abalam, and the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying. Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land, for I know not, I'm sorry, for I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou curse is cursed. All right. Uh, I'll say one more note, verse 7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with their payoffs, rewards, the words, rewards of divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spake these words unto, spake unto him the words of Balak. All right. So we're going to stop right there. Uh, foundational uh, setting for you, understanding kind of what's going on here in the text. Remember, our topic is blessing and cursing, and the issues that we were talking about are, uh, can we bless? Can we curse? Can we decree? Can man do these things? We talked about how God is able, how God said this and said that. We talked about how uh, he said about Abram, he said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them he, I will curse him that curseth thee from the, from Genesis 12, right? And so we see God saying this and saying that. Uh, and, and we see in the book of Genesis, uh, very powerful words in chapter three of Genesis. So uh, we see God bringing a curse there as well. When Adam and Eve are, are in the garden and the serpent comes in the garden uh, and he, he convinces uh, Eve to participate in rebellion against God's word, uh, God cursed them. Let's watch how uh, the Lord, it starts out with verse one in Genesis chapter three. Let's go there for just a moment. Let me give you a second. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any, any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. So we got that. We know he's subtle. He's unique. Um, it is not simply that he is a serpent in the, the simplicity of the 
uh, animal kingdom serpent, Nakash, in the Hebrew, Nakash. But he is a, he's a serpent that is empowered. He's some kind of divinated or uh, in, influenced or uh, filled in a field with a spirit, not, not Yahweh's spirit, but the spirit of the rebeller, the rebeller or the enemy. All right. So this is the serpent he's referring to. The serpent says all the stuff to the woman. We know we know that story, I think, pretty well. Uh, gets her to be willing to uh, disobey God, saying, thou shalt not surely die. God knows the day you eat thereof, you, your eyes will be open, uh, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's verse 5. The woman saw that the, the, so, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and we always remark these things, things that are symbolic. And the idea of seeing, ra, ra, is the best, the proper term for evil. The word seeing is, uh, in, in Israel, is the term that is used for evil quite a bit. All right. And uh, because seeing is the counterpoint to faith. And God has always said, the just shall live by faith. All throughout scripture, we see that it's faith that God is pleased with, Abram be being the model uh, that we talk about quite frequently. All right, let's keep on moving though. So the eyes of them were open and they saw that they were naked. So we saw all the problems that come, right? comes from this. Then God calls them out in verse nine, it starts with Adam. Adam, the Lord says to him, where art thou, right? And, uh, you know, he was said he was afraid because he was naked. And this is how this whole confrontation gets going. That how did you know you're naked? So that whole, this whole scenario kicks off there. All right. And the Lord says, verse 14, and the Lord said, Lord God said to the serpent, so Yahweh Elohim, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. All right. And above or beyond more than all cattle and above or beyond every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust of and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, her seed, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right. I, I don't want to get the lesson is not for today is not about the issues of the garden. It's just for us to see that God, uh, in this case, so we see that God called out the curse. God made clear what would be the response because of what he had done. And then he starts going into the woman and to the man, how the response would be because of what they had done. But the point is, God brings a curse on the situation. Now, first of all, let's do, first of all, in this context, let's understand and reiterate the sovereignty of God and our need to acknowledge him. Uh, the scripture says to us in Proverbs chapter three, what is this? Verse six, uh, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. He shall direct your path. Acknowledging God's sovereignty is a key element to trying to understand blessing and cursing and who has the right or power or, or so forth to be able to bless or to curse. We don't want to get out of line with God no matter what. Uh, somebody may say, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to pray that. But what is more important than anything another individual uh, has to say is what God has to say. All right. And I want to uh, emphasize that sovereignty. Let's deal with the word sovereignty for, for a second. The sovereignty or it comes from the root word sovereign. Sovereign means having the right to rule and um, to to demand and even de decree a thing, call a thing. Uh, that be not as though it's work. Let's go see how we prove that over in Romans chapter four. We will go New Testament or we go back to New Testament here to help us to comprehend how we get here. No book spell. All right. Uh, Romans chapter four. Let's come back to that in a second. All right. And I think it's like verse 13, but I'll just tell you the verse in a second. Let me do it. All right. Okay. Talking about the righteousness of Abraham and how Abraham, uh, um, praise God, believed God. All right. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. Okay. Okay. The blessing of Abraham. And... 
I, I do normally always looking look at this. All right, so let's uh, verse eighteen, four and eighteen. Who talking about Abraham? Uh, verse seventeen. I'm sorry, and eighteen. All right, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is the first thing. I have made thee a father of many nations. This is God talking to Abraham. The reference here is when God told him, you're going to be the father of many nations in chapter 17 of Genesis. All right. Before him, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. The God who makes the dead alive, in other words, is what he said, quickeneth, right? Uh, he says, this same God is the God that calls those things that be not as though they were. The first thing I want to get there is he's talking like a sovereign. See, that scripture is things that we use and sometimes we've heard in the church use inappropriately in which people tell, tell the uh, congregants to call those things that be not as though they were. But God never said you can call things that be not as though they were. That would be a little bit of an error. Um, it's God, if you read it carefully, who call us those things that be not as though they were. Because why? God is sovereign. That's why. He has the right and the authority to call something uh, that is not present into the presence. He said, let there be light. We go back to Genesis chapter one and we see all the things God called, the grass he called, the animals he called, the fish he called. That's the that is the province, or put it that way, this is the the right of God, the creator, to be able to call things that are not in existence into existence. Okay. Frequently we've been given somewhat the impression that that's something that is a right of, of believers. But we have to remember it's God who is sovereign, and we are his children, sheep of his pasture. And yes, we do have, as his children, we do have. Uh, aspects and elements of him, but those aspects and elements of him that we have are under his sovereign authority. When someone gives you power, someone gives you authority, you don't be, you don't usurp them. You don't become their master. A uh, uh, servant is not greater than his master. Is that right? So you don't become their master, and and, and rather you. Be, are allowed now to operate in knowledge, ability, and even rights that they have. Uh, given out to you that they have allowed you to operate in. That's what you do at that point. So we want to make sure that's part of our understanding that God is a sovereign. When you would hear things like uh, Darius made a decree, let's use that for, for instance, Cyrus made a decree. These be, That is because these were kings. And as kings, they thought themselves to be like gods. All right. Thought themselves to simply be able to make a law uh, and say it's the law, and that everyone had to adhere to it. Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, for the prefer. He did the same thing, right? He said things, and he made a decree. Uh, Darius did it, made a decree, and ended up getting uh, Daniel thrown into the lion's den. He was so sorry about it because he didn't realize what he said had caused such a problem. Then same thing with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, he wanted him to bow before his golden image, and like, no, Daniel's, you know, the uh, the the uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going about before his image, you know. So um, they went into the fiery furnace. They said, well, you know, if our God saves us, he, he can. And if he doesn't, he still can. And he's still our God because we have faith in God, faith in God. Not that uh, we know what God is going to do. Uh, we don't know what God is going to do. But we know he's able. We trust God. You know, faith in God is a, a different idea than having what I said before to you all, psychological cert certainty. You know, where you in your mind say, I know that it's true, that I believe it's true, and that's why it's going to be this way. No, no, no. I don't have psychological cert certainty because I don't know what God says, what God wants. I don't know what his plan is exactly. But I do have confidence in God's righteousness, God's goodness, God's kindness, God's wisdom, God's mercy, God's power. And therefore, I know God can, I know God will, and even if he doesn't, he's still God. And, and that's what faith in God is really calling out and bringing to the table and recognizing his sovereignty. He's God. 
it doesn't matter if he does what I want or not. He's still God, and I'm still going to honor him as God. All right, that's big. I mean, that is humongous for us to understand and comprehend, that sovereignty of God. Now, the next piece is then blessings. For example, for example, in cursings, we talked about the blessing that Jacob received from his father. Uh, when he, he Isaac, uh, in last week's lesson, we talked about how Isaac was intending to bless Esau and Rebecca and Jacob um, basically concocted a scheme to make Jacob appear, or feel, I'm sorry, because uh, Isaac's eyes were dim, he couldn't see, but to feel like and smell like Esau. And at that point, uh, Isaac blessed Jacob with the blessing that he wanted to give to Esau. All right. Then when Esau arrived, remember where we were? We were in Genesis, uh, we were chapter 27, 28. And uh, he, he's like, well, you know what? Uh, all right, dad, well, bless me too. And he's like, I already gave the blessing to Jacob. You know, and he said, your brother has come. And uh, let's go turn there for a moment because some of that language is useful and I, I love the word of God. I love the language of God. I want to hopefully inspire others to love the language and the word of God similarly and recognize how key and critical it is versus um, all of these, um, I'm just going to say in my opinion, uh, paraphrased text in which people are paraphrasing text rather than just studying the text. There's errors in translations. No one argues about that. Uh, the issue is when you start paraphrasing it and saying this is the new version, are you are you claiming that you have gotten all of the errors out? There's absolutely no errors in what you just trans just translated. And if the answer to that question is no, then why don't you just leave it alone and we'll all keep studying, you know, as we ought to what we have and do our etymology studies, language studies, word studies, and all that stuff. Okay. So here's the words uh, that. Isaac said to Esau when he said, oh, come on, uh, bless me uh, and, and, and bless me in the same way. Esau heard the words of his father, verse 34, 27 and 34 of Genesis. And he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me even so also, my father, O my father. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and have taken away thy blessing. All right. Thy brother has come with subtlety, slick, 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 and he has taken away thy blessing, is what Isaac said to Esau. And that raises a very interesting point in question. Does that mean then that the blessing that Isaac had could only be given out once? Or that he couldn't call it back. I mean, if it's if it was of God, the blessing, why did God even let the blessing go through? You know, think about these things. These are the depths of things that, you know, raise the questions that sometimes people don't want to ask or dig into uh, as they're trying to understand this stuff. God says, listen, um, I'm involved, but I'm involved when I want to get involved because I'm sovereign. Uh, if I don't choose to get involved, that's telling you something about what it is and how I feel about it. If I don't get involved, that means I don't want to get involved. Um, or what happened is exactly what I wanted to happen. That would be uh, probably a good predictor that what's happening here is what he's trying to have happen. All right. He says, your brother has taken the blessing. Now, the blessing came out of Isaac's mouth, if you recall. It came out of his mouth. Uh, couldn't he just say, well, I take back what I just said? And the, and the answer to that question is he could not. Uh, scripture says this uh, teaches us this principle uh, it's better not to bow than to bow and to break it your words you speak go out into the world they go out into creation they go out into the uh, power of the of what is and they are acknowledged or they're not acknowledged by God they are empowering or they're not empowered by uh, God they are they are recognized or they're not recognized. I mean, if Yahweh didn't want Jacob to be blessed, why didn't he just ex just expose Jacob and Rebecca's scheme, you know, to Isaac? Why didn't he say, oh, they're trying to set up a scheme? Well, I'm going to make sure that they don't get away with this scheme. I'm going to make uh, Isaac to know that this is a scheme so he doesn't lay his hands on Jacob and give the blessing that should go to uh, Esau to Jacob. That's not what God did. God did not do that. God did not let Isaac know. He allowed it to go down exactly that way. 
So he's telling us something inside of that action right there. All right. Yahweh didn't do anything. Uh, and if Yahweh didn't want Jacob to have the blessing power, uh, he could have done other things. He could have stopped him from being able to say anything. Clearly, it was less, uh, it was clearly a scheme. And clearly, as a scheme, it was less than candid. He was obviously, uh, Rebecca and uh, Jacob were operating in, uh, if, if nothing less, deception. Okay. He might not say a lie. He maybe didn't say he was uh, uh, exactly that, but he definitely operated in deception. Right. But God didn't do anything about it. So remember the idea that God is sovereign. Remember how we discussed the idea uh, that when God wants to give something, he can give a power to someone. It, when he said, uh, when Jesus says, my peace uh, uh, is a power, I'm giving you peace. All right. He, last week, we talked about how he said, my peace I give unto thee in John chapter 14. Not as the world give I unto thee, give I unto thee. Uh, he gives a peace. He gives a different kind of peace and he gives it in a manner in which it is transformative it's not just any old thing but it is a powerful peace that comes from god a peace that it changes the environment that was in luke we were talking about and we were talking about when jesus sent the disciples the 70 out right chapter 10 he sent the 70 out and he said to them i want you to go and when you go into a house before you enter the house send your peace into the house your peace, something connected to yourself is what he's referring to. How do they have this peace? This peace that can go and then bring peace to the house and settle on that house. Or if the son of, if the son of peace does not live there, someone who is not in fellowship with the peace, then your peace will return to you. And at that point, you should leave and, and leave that house and shake the dust off your feet from that town, that city. You all recall that whole conversation. Really big stuff, really big thing that God is doing. Very spiritual, very mysterious. That's what he's doing. And said, well, what's going on? There is power of God, excuse me, that can be transfer or transferred. And also it is transformative. It's transformative. It's transferable. Um, he, what is this transformable, term, transformable idea? Well, what does he say? He caused, me, he caused me to lie down in green pastures. He restored my soul. We gave you that word for restore from the Hebrew S-U-V, uh, which is S-U-V, where we would, we would spell it suv. And that is to return. That is to cause you to return. We talked about the Hebraism, the uh, Kabbalistic concept of the drop of water who leaves the ocean. He's evaporated up into the sky, into the cloud, travels around the world, lands in the or lands somewhere as a moisture uh, uh, is rehydrated, drops back to the ground, be, finds himself in a stream or a river, and eventually out of that stream or river, that drop of water returns back to the ocean. Well, that's a similar Similar principle that in in that in that um, tradition, in that we always, if we belong to God from the beginning, if we came from God as the ocean, as it were, as a metaphor, then we will return back to God. What he's saying here, he restores us back to our place, restores us to our peace. The peace that he gives that remains in that house is peace that God gave us. If I can speak a peace, my peace to this house, I didn't come, I didn't, I didn't create the peace myself. The Lord God is the provider of that peace. Okay. And then the idea that it's transferable then is because God gave it. He's, Jesus says in that uh, John 14, my peace, 14, 27 and 28, my peace I give unto you. And it is not the same Maybe we should read that for you. Let's go to that John. Uh, obviously, it's chapter St. John, chapter 14, and verse number 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. And I want to no note this. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be, neither let it be afraid. Uh, stop right there. Not. So what he's saying is his peace is not like a, the world offers a, success, a cessation of violence. When we say peace, we're like in the middle of a war 
and discussing things in a war and saying, well, the secession of violence, the Lord, that, that, that they stop fighting, they're going to stop shooting or whatever, and they're going to take a break. That's not what God is saying. God is saying, I'm bringing you back to who you are. I'm changing your soul. I'm, I'm bringing you to a new place, a new way of life, a place that belongs to those who are part of the divine family. That's what it is. It's so much different. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 36, there's a, there's a hint of this. So let's go to Ezekiel 36 and uh, watch how the promise of this, uh, this kind of thing is illustrated by one of the major prophets so far back. So in verse number 20, uh, Ezekiel 26, I'm sorry, 36 verse, ooh, I love all this, guys. I'm just going to say with, uh, um, mm -mm -mm. let's start with verse 24. All right. For I will take you from among the heathen. That's the first thing. All right. So we're in Ezekiel 36, 24. I'm going to take you away from the heathen. He's already saying this is a change right here. Um, and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Verse 26 is the money verse, if you don't mind me using that term. A new heart also will I give you. Let me read that verse, that opening phrase. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Don't mix up sin and flesh concepts right now. He's saying flesh in this concept is one that is functional, one that is working, one that has life in it versus a stony heart, which is one that is not functional, one that is hard, one that does not have life in it. As a matter of fact, it's rebellious and resistant. That's the idea of stony. It can't, it won't function the way it's supposed to function. He says, I will give you a new heart. Okay. So he, uh, this is, this is t telling us he's changing the heart. Uh, he's moved things. He's shifting things. Uh, this is what Jesus is really talking about in Matthew. Now, back to our previous lesson, Matthew, what, chapter 16. He says to uh, Simon, after asking, so whom do men say that I am, right? And he builds, he's building, he's building, he's building on this. And watch what he's saying here. All right, uh, Simon, uh, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven, Right. Then he goes on saying, I, and also I say unto thee that thou art Peter, uh, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We broke that down. We talked about where it was at, near the area of Mount Hermon and the principles in the area that it refers to as a spot where evil had a gateway into the earth. Okay, verse 19, though, uh, Matthew 16 and 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, in heaven, and whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But freeze this for a second. I want to make sure you hear that with the Greek, um, out, out of the Greek, actually, from Septuagint, right? And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou bind on earth, having been bound, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, having been loosed in heaven, uh, have, sh having been loosed shall be loosed uh, in, in heaven. I mean, having been loosed in heaven shall be loosed. What is a, what is a pre precept and the principle is whatever you bind, if it's been bound in heaven, you'll be able to bind it. Whatever you loose, if, if it's been loosed in heaven, you'll be able to loose it. So what we're getting here is uh, an update on the sovereignty of God that these actions of being able to call things into the world or being able to say something about something to the world is dependent on whether God, the sovereign, all right, has said it first. If God has said it, you are in a good stead. So we understand you're in a position of transforming. You're in a position of, of, of uh, transferring, right? Speak the peace over that house, and you can bring, you can transfer your peace to that house, right? All right. Then you got the next part of it. It operates only operates can only operate as long as it does not violate the providential sovereignty of God. It has to be within the sovereignty of God. 
that takes us back to Jacob because we know that Esau was not worthy or even appreciative of the idea of having the birthright, at, uh, uh, evidence being e.g. as it were. He sold his birthright to, the, uh, to Jacob already for a bowl of soup. We already know he had already sold it, right? So when he didn't get it and he didn't get the blessing that goes with it, he shouldn't have been surprised. No one should have been shocked that what was right actually occurred, even though it happened through some degree of, dis or I'll say, disingenuousness and a little bit of deception from Rebecca, uh, their mother, and from uh, Jacob. There was some deception there. Nevertheless, it was still operating in the sovereign will of God. It was not God's will for Esau to receive it. Somebody might say, you're supposing, you're, you're speculating. No, Esau had shown himself not to be honorable and not to honor the placing, the position that he was in. And by that principle, you could see that God would have not selected him. Similar to Cain and Abel. Cain was the elder, but he did not choose. He did not choose to honor the things of God. And consequently, he was not accepted. And then he turned murderous. So proving that it was his non, his, he was not eligible because of something in his own character and soul that made him ineligible. So this is very, very important, very important for us to keep in mind. So in the case, back to our initial reading and text um, with regard to Balaam and Balak. Uh, I'm not trying to teach you the whole story of Balaam and Balak. That's not my point. My point was for you to see the model of it, that Balak, who was the king of the Moabites, wanted Balaam to move in his priesthood. He was a Median priest, excuse me, and he had operated in priesthood, and he it was noted for the fact he operated with power. And in verse number six, back to Numbers 22, verse 60, verse number six, he says in the last pericope or the last phrase area, he says, For I what that I know, what is the old English way of saying no? So uh, you know, K-N-O-W, where we would spell it. He says, For I know what or I know that he whom thou bless is blessed. And whom, he whom thou cursest is cursed. That's why he called on Balaam in the first place. He believed that Balaam had the power to call it out. Uh, let's say call those things that be not as though they were. He believed that Balaam in his own ability and sovereignty could just simply make a decision and make a call and that it would come to pass because he had called it out. But Balaam when he got, when he started on his way, the Lord stopped him. He started to try to do the work. He, he said, let, let me wait overnight, and then I'm going to tell y'all what God tells me. All right? And in verse number 12, 22 and 12, God says to Balaam, thou shall not go with, um, thou shall not go with them. Thou shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Remember the Lord had already said he's going to bless Abraham and bless his seed, right? And all nations will be blessed in him, right? That's already been established. So it's like, you're, you, I've already blessed them. I called them blessed already. You're not going to curse them. And he tells them not to. Then Balaam raises up in the morning, tells them uh, uh, to the princes of Balak, those who came with the money and the people, they all came with the divination payoff. You know, when you go to a soothsayer and go to a palm reader, you know, you got to have your money because they don't do it for free, right? All right. So they had all come with the money from Balak, from the king and stuff to say, hey, here's what you, we're going to pay you for person uh israel right and uh he, he he gets up in the morning he says get into your land for the lord refuses to give me leave to go with you the lord won't let me go and he told me don't go right and then they come back oh wait a minute you can't do that you know don't you know the king wants you to come he and uh, balak sent again princess in verse 15 with more honorable than the previous ones and a higher level and promise even more and he said you know what you could just give me a whole house full of gold let's go to verse 18 and Balaam said, answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. There is Balaam's recognition. Oh my goodness. You're trying to get me to go against God. No, it doesn't matter what you offer me. I can't do something to go beyond the word of God. 
And later on, you'll continue to see that as you continue to read that story, if you want to read it all the way through, it's going to get uh, more and more solidified. The reality is God's sovereignty and the word of God is the overruling power and the overarching authority. And when it comes to blessing and cursing, we can't call somebody to be well that God hasn't called to be well. We can't call something that happened as far as growth or that that God hasn't called to happen. What we can do is pray, uh, as, as the scripture tells us to do, uh, be careful with, for nothing. And uh, with Thanksgiving, let's go there for a moment. I'm going to just read that text to you. Philippians, go with me, uh, chapter 4. Philippians, back to New Testament, ride with me. Go right back with me. And let's look at that uh, text as actually the proper thought and uh, model uh, for us. Of chapter 4 of Philippians, he says in verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, but with everything, no matter what the topic is, whatever the issue is, uh, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make sure you're doing praises, make sure you're honoring, make sure you're praise singing, make sure you're dancing. Let your requests be made known unto God and the God of peace which passes and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he gives them some details on what you ought to focus on. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report will be good to hear about. Things that whatsoever things that have virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Already, verse eight. So. Here we have basically a layout that, yes, people can say they can go out and curse something or go out and bless something, but ultimately it's God's sovereignty that must be honored. And if God doesn't say yes, if God doesn't agree, you better not try to do it, all right? Ultimately, you'll learn that in more in the story of Balaam because there was an angel in the road with his sword out. And you read chapter 22 into chapter 23 of, of Numbers. And you'll see that his sword was there and he was going to kill Balaam because Balaam was considering, well, should I go? Don't go. Or can I go? He kept getting offers. So you're going to get killed. The donkey, his donkey or his ass basically saw it and he couldn't see it. But then finally God opened up Balaam's eyes and said, don't you see that angel right there? You better go tell him I cannot curse what God has not cursed. And only through the words of God can this be anything be done. The power belongs to God. The sovereignty belongs to God. What we can do is pray. Hallelujah. Make our petitions, our requests be made known unto God. And then in our hearts say, if the Lord will, this or that shall occur. Well, praise God for it. Prayer blesses, blesses you and keeps you all strong and gives you better understanding and insight in this area. We may have one, we probably have one more on this area we can tap, tap into. Uh, prayer, this is blessing you and keeping you. So God bless in Jesus' name. Amen.